If you drive here in the UK, the last time you filled up your tank, you might have noticed an array of new signs and posters talking about the new version of petrol called E10. The government's website has some pretty wondrous claims, like switching to E10 will reduce Britain's CO2 emissions by 750,000 tonnes per year, which is insane, or as they put it, the equivalent of taking 350,000 cars off the road, or all of the cars in North Yorkshire. That is a pretty wondrous claim indeed, but what's the deal? What is E10? What is the, the actual benefits and drawbacks? And are those claims actually true? Well, let's take a look uh, and explain pretty much all of that. Now first, you'll need to know what E10 actually is. Petrol, as we know it, has been sold as a blend of both pure petrol or gasoline and ethanol or alcohol since as early as 2008 here in the UK. Up until just a couple years ago, the blend or the mixture of ethanol and gasoline has been somewhat loosely defined, but generally speaking, it's been up to about 5% of ethanol and then up to, well, 100% of petrol or as little as 95%. But as of a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, uh, the government introduced the E5 labeling, which specifically mandated a blend of around 5% ethanol and 95% petrol. The specific part with ethanol there is actually bioethanol, which is uh, ethanol that is made from renewable sources like crops. Uh, and gen generally speaking, it does have to be grown specifically right now for things like sugar canes. Although in theory, it can be produced by using say waste material from existing crops rather than having to grow new ones. So if E5 just stands for 5% ethanol, then it should be pretty obvious what E10 means. It's the same setup, it's the same bioethanol, it's just a larger up to 10% share instead of up to 5%. But why bother mixing them, blending them at all? Well, there are a number of different reasons, but the one that the companies like to talk about the most is emissions. Generally speaking, pure ethanol uh, produces around a third less CO2 for the same volume of fluid when it's burned compared to pure petrol or, or pure gasoline. And so reducing emissions by a full third is a pretty big win, right? Well, yes, but there is also a catch. The energy density, the, the amount of energy that is stored in a given volume of that material, that, that fluid, is considerably lower in ethanol. Actually, somewhat coincidentally, it's almost a third less energy dense. Being more specific, it's 35% less uh, carbon emissions and about 30% less energy dense. So while it is a cleaner fuel, it isn't by all that much. It is worth noting though that I'm only talking about CO2 emissions here as that's what the, the UK government site claims, but uh, burning ethanol exclusively produces things like zero methane and significantly reduced uh, things like uh, NOx emissions, particulates, and a number of other uh, emissions and pollutants aren't produced when burning ethanol versus when you burn petrol. So there is some more nuance to this debate rather than just the straight CO2 figures. That sounds great, but you might have already noticed a problem. If ethanol is 30% less energy dense, then, well, you need to burn more of it to get the same power output. As in, if you want to travel a given distance, all other things being equal, you'll need to burn more ethanol than you will if you're just running pure petrol. And because it's a blend, the more ethanol you put in right, as that blend or the bigger percentage, the more of your total fuel you'll need to burn to travel that same distance. And if you have to burn more fuel, well, guess what? That means more emissions. If you take the numbers presented in this US Energy Information Administration report, 
big name I know uh, from 2014, uh, which are 19.64 pounds of CO2 per US gallon of pure gasoline, 18.95 pounds per gallon of E10, and 12.72 pounds per gallon of pure ethanol. We can work out what our current E5 fuel would produce in terms of its, its CO2 outputs, which works out to be about 19.29 pounds per US gallon. That means that E10 produces around 1.78% less CO2 per US gallon of fuel. But remember, we need to burn more of that fuel to get the same power outputs, and it turns out that E10 is about 1.5% less energetic than E5, so we need to use, well, more fuel to get the same energy output. When you then correct the volume for the same energy output, you'll find that E10 only actually produces around 0.273% less CO2. 0.27%. That's hardly setting the world on fire, pun intended. And actually, if you apply that CO2 saving to the national annual consumption of fuel, which the RAC estimates at 16.9 billion litres a year, which is just absolutely insane, well, you find that E10 will only produce around 100,000 tonnes less CO2 per year, not the 750,000 tonnes that the government claims. In fact, the way that you get that number is to conveniently forget that there is a, an energy density difference, and if you don't correct for that, at least with my maths, that comes out to just shy of 700,000 tonnes a year, which, well, I'd call that within margin of error, but if you do correct for that energy density difference, which they do talk about on the, the site, they say that your fuel consumption will be around 1% worse, well, when you account for that, it's a lot less significant. But Andrew, that's still less CO2, and that's a good thing, right? Well, yeah, it is. It's fantastic. I'm very happy to, to see any reduction. Anything we can do to reduce our, well, greenhouse gas emissions is certainly welcomed. But it's hardly the perfect solution. It's what I would call hardly making a dent. And there's actually some other problems as well. Because you need to burn 1.5% more fuel to do the same journeys, at the current and absolutely insane price of petrol, which nationwide the average is 143p and 91 or 143.91 pence, uh, and with the average mileage of 7,400 miles a year and the average MPG at around 36, well, you'll be spending about 20 pounds a year more on your petrol just to do the same journeys and that's not factoring in any price increases which looks to be the case that it's just going to keep climbing and so that's kind of a bit of a problem there's actually another problem too which is vehicle compatibility that's one of the main things all of the signage around the fuel pumps is talking about. And the reason for that is that the government's own website claims around 600,000 cars that are currently on the road in the UK aren't compatible with E10. That's actually a pretty big deal. And the reason they aren't compatible, or one of the reasons anyway, is that most relatively modern cars are fitted with what's called a flex fuel sensor. What that does is measure the ethanol content of the fuel that's going into your engine, and it can dynamically alter how much fuel it puts in every time it opens an injector based on that ethanol content. Whereas if you don't have one of those sensors, your car and your engine's computer, or let's say your carburetor if you're that way inclined, that won't know what sort of energy density your fuel has. It assumes that you're running, let's, let's say, pure gasoline, maybe E5 at best. And so when it puts that less energy dense fuel in, you're actually running your engine lean, which is a fairly bad thing and can be fairly damaging to your engine. And so it's a, a kind of big deal that E10 is now the standard 
everywhere. It can also be the case that uh, if your vehicle is on the older side, a lot of, especially rubber fuel lines, often aren't rated for ethanol content almost at all, or if they are, it's very light, like E5, whereas E10 steps that up another notch, and ethanol can be very, uh, well, nasty to your, uh, to your piping, and so, again, that can be a pretty serious concern for the sort of older vehicles especially. Now, luckily, E5 isn't going away. It's just only going to be available in the premium super unleaded category, which is also kind of a problem because if you need E5, and generally speaking, the sorts of people who are going to need to use E5 are the sorts of people who are likely knocking about in early 2000s bangers who can't really afford anything else, and you're gonna have to be paying super unleaded prices, which again, at the current insane price tag is something around, uh, what, 153p or something along those lines. And that means that you're gonna be paying an extra 130 pounds a year just to keep your car running. Don't get me wrong, this is still a net positive change. Anything we can do to reduce our emissions is welcomed. And the, the, the source of folk who are in a fortunate enough position to afford a bit of extra fuel cost, like me, or well, at least should be fine shouldering a few extra quid a year, but I do feel for the, the sorts of people who are in a less fortunate position and who are now going to be shouldering potentially a significant increase in your fuel bill every year, and this isn't a perfect solution. On top of the, the whole, well, the lack of emissions differences, it's also worth noting that the, the crops that are being grown to create this bioethanol is taking up land that could otherwise be used for, well, actual food crops, or even better, forests and woodlands that will be able to capture carbon and retain it, rather than capture it only to immediately emit it all back out again, and with added energy usage to convert those crops into that ethanol to then transport it for us to then burn. The proper solution is to not need to burn hydrocarbons, but that's probably a topic for another video. The government's claims that switching from E5 to E10 will save 750,000 tonnes a year of CO2 from being produced is, at least by my calculations, well, either uh, kind of at best it's purposefully misleading and at worst it is a deliberate lie. Uh, it really is sort of twisting the statistics uh, in your favour and the, the what about ism that they have on explaining away the, the fuel cost difference or the fuel consumption difference is pretty painful because this could have been discussed it fully truthfully, it could have still like a hundred thousand tons of CO2 not being produced is a significant benefit. And they also could have had a better approach to making sure that they're not burdening costs on people who are already struggling with ever increasing costs of just running their vehicle and you know staying alive. But again, uh, that might be a topic for probably another channel. And let's face it, I'm an idiot on the internet, so what do I know? But if you like listening to this idiot ramble on, then you can hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and uh, hit the notifications bell to be updated and notified when new videos come out, which is pretty much every week. You can also check out a whole load of other videos on the channel, things like car reviews, how-to guides, and a load of other stuff. So check that out in the cards as well. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so by checking out one of these at the wheel t-shirts or hoodies, or checking out some of the affiliate links that are in the description, places like Amazon if you're interested. Uh, otherwise, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, thoughts yourself, if I've missed anything, or you just want to shout at me, feel free to do so in the comments down below. Uh, and otherwise, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.